State versus state warfare is rare today, replaced by insurgencies and unconventional conflicts. As you're listening to me, I'm confident that somewhere in the world there's an insurgency or a civil war raging. Since the time of World War II, far more people have been fighting their own governments or inside a particular state than in wars between states. Conventional war still occurs, as in the Arab-Israeli wars, but they tend to be short and intense without changing the map very much. If you looked at a graph of people killed in battle since World War II, the trend line is bumpy, but it definitely points downward. Has conventional war, government versus government conflict, become obsolete? Some serious thinkers suggest that it is dying out. Among the prominent theories is that socioeconomic change and globalization have tied economies and societies together. Also, might the pain of loss from today's smaller families with fewer young men to spare make societies less eager for war? One expression of this thinking is known as the McDonald's theory of war, that no two countries with a McDonald's fast food restaurant have ever gone to war. It's not that the meals are magic. The idea is that if your economy is sophisticated enough to support a McDonald's, it's sophisticated enough to not fight another such society. The problem with this idea is that it is flatly wrong. There have been at least a half dozen McDonald's wars out there where both sides had McDonald's restaurants. Examples. In 1989, the United States invaded Panama. In 1999, NATO went to war against Serbia and Pakistan fought India. These were all McDonald's wars. In 2006, Israel invaded Lebanon. Russia fought Georgia in 2008 and against Ukraine in 2014. These were McDonald's wars too. But what if we get away from focusing on fast food and instead ask the question of whether economic ties mean that countries won't go to war? There's some appeal to this premise. If you think that big business runs everything, then big business might not want to mess up the smooth functioning of the world economy. Even if you're less conspiratorial, it makes intuitive sense that a country wouldn't want to go to war with a close trading partner. The problem, though, is that the historical evidence for this is also weak. Look at World War I. The world economy was already highly globalized and interdependent at the time. The war started between Serbia and Austria-Hungary. And Serbia's exports were dominated by the food it sent to Austria. Germany's biggest trading partners were Britain and Russia. And it went to war with both of them. So economic ties seem to be no guarantee against war. Even if rational calculation states that going to war is costly, sometimes political leaders aren't driven by the rational calculations of profit and loss. There's also the democratic peace theory, which suggests that two democracies are unlikely to fight. So the gradual spread of democracy makes the world safer. This is an old idea going back to the 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. He argued that in democracies, the people who choose to go to war are the people who suffer. So democracy means peace. Now this is true as a general tendency, but as a practical guide, it's less useful than you might think. Democracies do rarely fight against one another, but democracies fight non-democracies all the time. Think of all the wars the United States has waged. And the pattern of non-conflict is strongest for long-established democracies. New democracies that haven't quite fully consolidated how they're going to do things can be more violent. And for that matter, what exactly is a democracy? Up until the 1920s, women were not allowed to vote in most places around the world. So do we count as democracies the societies where only men or only white men vote? Well, if we narrow things to only places with full suffrage for all adults, then our universe of examples gets a lot smaller and less impressive. To illustrate the point, if we accept the premise that a democracy is a place where more or less all men can vote, then there are some really big and important wars that look a lot like democracies fighting each other. 
Under that logic, the U.S. Civil War was a war between two democracies. Both sides let white men vote and sent out largely white men to get killed. In World War I, all the great powers had elected legislatures. And while Russia and Germany were not perfect democracies, each had elections and those elections mattered. So you'd have to be careful with your definitions to explain why World War I is not democracies fighting each other. And if you do too much of that, it looks like you're torturing your definitions to get the result you want. My problem with the democratic peace theory is that it doesn't help us much with the questions we really care about. If you tell me prosperous, long-standing democracies don't go to war with each other, my response is, thanks for nothing. Nobody's really worried about the United States going to war with Canada or Denmark going to war with Sweden. It doesn't help us with the real problems we face. Of all the theories out there for why war has gotten less common since 1945, the one that seems to me to have the most merit, though it's no guarantee, is called the nuclear peace. This is something of a paradox. The presence of nuclear weapons puts a limit on how destructive wars can be. If wars were to get out of hand, their destructive potential could eliminate the entire human species. So that limits how destructive we can get in actual practice. What political objective can possibly justify the end of the human race? Now, we need to be clear about the limitations of this kind of thinking. First, nuclear powers have started wars with non-nuclear powers. The United States settled for a stalemate in Korea and lost in Vietnam even though it possessed nuclear weapons. In both cases, North Korea and Vietnam had backing from big powers with nuclear weapons of their own. So the United States could understandably fear escalation and retaliation. But even when losing lives in a deteriorating situation such as Afghanistan, the United States did not use nuclear weapons. Part of that was a lack of good targets, but it's also a matter of political goals. Wars are fought to achieve some political goal, and it's hard to see how using nuclear weapons gets you towards a political objective. Flipping this around, it's also true that non-nuclear powers have attacked nuclear-armed states. Israel has never confirmed nor denied that it has nuclear weapons, but all informed observers agree that Israel does possess them. That was reasonably clear even back in 1973 when Egypt initiated a war against Israel. Egypt seems to have trusted that Israel wouldn't use its nuclear weapons unless Israel's very existence were at stake. And Egypt kept its objectives strictly limited. Finally, nuclear armed states have fought each other on multiple occasions. Soviet pilots and anti-aircraft gunners shot down American airmen during the Korean War and brought down perhaps as many as 200 spy plane crew members flying over Soviet territory. The Soviet Union and China fought a border war in the late 1960s. And Pakistan launched the Kargil War against India in 1999 when both sides had demonstrated nuclear weapons. The point is that nuclear weapons don't guarantee peace. Having said all that, what could we possibly mean by a nuclear peace? Here's what I have in mind. The presence of nuclear weapons makes a direct attack by a nuclear power against another nuclear power so risky and dangerous that it's hard to imagine any rational leader trying it. It does seem that the presence of nuclear weapons rules out the conscious decision to start a particular kind of war where the vital national interests of a nuclear power might be threatened. Border skirmishes are one thing, like the Soviet-Chinese conflict in the 1960s. Most of India and Pakistan's clashes, and Egypt's attack on Israel in 1973, fall into those categories as well. The stakes are relatively small, so they don't rise to a level justifying nuclear weapons. But the scenarios for World War III, a Russian invasion of Western Europe, or a bolt-out-of-the-blue nuclear attack, those represent direct threats to the vital interests of a nuclear power and could easily, even probably, provoke a nuclear response. Accidental war is also a possibility. 
What about a malfunctioning sensor that mistakenly reports an incoming nuclear strike, as happened during the Cold War? Or what about miscalculation and escalation? A small-scale war gets bigger through tit-for-tat retaliation until one side's red line gets crossed and nuclear weapons are used. What if a nuclear power bluffs by threatening nuclear use and that bluff gets called? To my mind, that's the most likely way that an India-Pakistan conflict could go nuclear. To finish this exercise, let's run through some nightmare scenarios of how we might still stumble into a great power war. Let me be clear, these are hypotheticals and solely my own thinking. My scenarios are based on no inside information and are unlikely to explode into reality in the near term. But the enormous consequences of great power war require us to think seriously about how to prevent large-scale conflicts. My scenarios will focus on Russia and China. First, Russia. There is no possibility of the U.S. and NATO initiating a war with Russia. Russians sometimes find that hard to believe, but it's quite clear. The downsides are enormous, and in any event, NATO works by consensus. That a couple dozen NATO countries would agree to start an aggressive war is not in the cards. So how could things go bad? In the past, Russia has had a pattern of aggressive behavior against some of its neighbors. In Georgia in 2008, and in Ukraine in 2014, Russia used armed force to strip territory away from a neighboring state. In 2008, the Georgians did Russia the favor of shooting first, but the Russians took full advantage of the situation. In each case, Russia created headaches for a potentially hostile neighboring state by creating territorial disputes that made it difficult or impossible for the neighbor to join NATO. And Russia scored some domestic political points. Further, because neither Georgia nor Ukraine were under NATO's collective defense umbrella, Russia could keep each conflict limited. Does this create the potential for future dangers? I think so, with some important qualifications. First, Vladimir Putin has more or less exhausted the possibilities of scoring easy victories for domestic political gain. Trying another short war would be much tougher. Russia's remaining neighbors are either friendly or subservient or would be much more difficult to swallow. Or, most importantly, they have the protection of NATO membership. It's hard to imagine Putin or anyone else in the Kremlin making a deliberate decision to start a war with NATO. While Russia might be able to mass land forces in a particular place for a quick local victory, say, for example, in the Baltic states, NATO's overall military advantages, plus its economic levers, make long-term success almost impossible for Russia to achieve. That's in addition to a lack of concrete economic benefits to Russia. The territorial enclaves from Georgia under Russia's protection, plus the Crimea and Donbass regions of Ukraine, cost Russia more to prop up than any economic benefit received. So it's hard to imagine that a rational calculation of costs and benefits would lead the Kremlin to view war with NATO in the Baltics as a good idea. That said, it's also hard to make a rational cost-benefit calculation on the wars that Russia has already fought. Russia lost big from the sanctions imposed after its fight with Ukraine and was stuck with propping up some money-losing territories. Clearly, something else was coming into play. Quite likely, Russia's perception of being under threat from the West and Putin's ability to turn quick foreign policy successes into higher domestic approval ratings. Thinking about it this way, it is possible to imagine a scenario in which the Kremlin is under siege from a popular movement and decides it needs to distract its public from a domestic crisis with a foreign policy adventure. Although the possibility of triggering war with NATO would be high risk, a future Russian government might see a higher risk from its own population. Likewise, a Russian regime that fears a NATO preemptive strike, something Vladimir Putin's Russian government certainly talked about, 
might respond to the potential deployment of NATO offensive systems to Russia's borders with a preemptive strike of its own, accompanied by threats of nuclear escalation should NATO respond. That might be enough to split the NATO alliance and create the space for Russia to imagine achieving victory. All this calls for careful, sober, well-thought-out policies discouraging Russia from further aggressive actions towards its neighbors, while at the same time not backing Russia into a corner and provoking rash and desperate actions that make everyone worse off. Let's close by looking at China's relationship with the rest of the world and judge how likely a war with China might be. This scary possibility is relatively new. During the final 20 years of the Cold War, the United States and China were de facto allies against the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had been initially China's patron and protector. But Mao Zedong chafed under the idea of being in second place and was willing to live with that only so long as Joseph Stalin was in power in the Soviet Union. Stalin had legitimacy and seniority in the world communist movement. After Stalin's death in 1953, Mao saw himself as the natural successor to communism's elder statesman. The Soviets, of course, didn't see it that way. A rapid breakdown in the Soviet-Chinese partnership resulted. The two quickly became enemies on personal, ideological, and territorial grounds. In 1969, this turned into a brief, undeclared border war over an island in the Usuri River, which marks part of their boundary. Relations got so bad that the Soviet government approached the administration of U.S. President Richard Nixon with a hypothetical. How would the U.S. government react if the Soviets were to carry out a preemptive nuclear strike to take out Chinese nuclear weapons installations? Nixon replied that he did not think this was a good idea. So when Nixon opened up relations with China in 1971, the United States and China were acting, in effect, as allies against what they perceived as a far more important threat from the Soviet Union. This relationship lasted through the end of the Cold War. When the United States shifted its diplomatic relations from Taiwan to mainland China, it nevertheless retained a vague defense commitment to Taiwan. But U.S.-China disagreements about Taiwan didn't seem that important in an atmosphere where both sides saw the Soviet Union as the chief threat. After the Cold War ended, the United States and China lost that common enemy, and their political relations began a slow decline. China's brutal suppression of its pro-democracy movement at Tiananmen Square in 1989 did not play well in the West. Meanwhile, as China's economy continued to grow, it saw itself as deserving a bigger place on the world stage and the United States as an obstacle to that. The long-standing issue of Taiwan made matters worse. China saw Taiwan as a rebellious breakaway province that should be returned to Chinese rule. But the United States had committed itself to the independence of Taiwan even though it broke official relations with Taiwan as part of warming up to China. In 1996, the Chinese launched missiles into the waters around Taiwan to intimidate it into accepting a return to China. The United States responded by sending naval carrier battle groups to the region, and China couldn't do anything about it. It lacked the military capability then to consider challenging the U.S. naval presence. China learned a lesson, however, and began the long process of building an ability to project power around the region. Its defense spending began a long and steady rise. What does this imply about the possibilities of a war with China? First, China has already started three substantial wars with neighbors when it felt its rights and prerogatives were being infringed. China went to war with India in 1962 over border disputes, even though the territories involved were remote and had little economic value. China gave India a bloody nose, made its point, and ended the fight. In 1969, China initiated border skirmishes with the Soviet Union. 
and tensions remained high until both sides agreed to a border settlement. In 1979, China fought a brief border war with Vietnam. Vietnam had invaded Cambodia to throw out the vicious and genocidal regime of Pol Pot and his Khmer Rouge party. Pol Pot was a mass murderer, but he was a Chinese client, and that mattered. After a short and bloody war, China decided the Vietnamese had been taught a lesson and withdrew. The point of all this is that China has a pattern of using war as a tool when it believes its territorial integrity or prestige are at stake. What makes the situation with Taiwan so dangerous is that Taiwan touches on both questions. From China's point of view, Taiwan is an integral part of the country, albeit ruled by a rebellious and an illegitimate government. In fact, for many decades, Taiwan was ruled by the late Chiang Kai-shek's Guomindang Party, which didn't agree with mainland China's communists on very much. What both sides did agree on was that Taiwan was an integral part of China. They just disagreed on which government was the legitimate ruler of China. To the Chinese communist in Beijing, they were the legitimate government of all China. To the Guomindang in Taiwan, it was them. The question of who was right could be settled by war, but neither side was willing to risk that step. The small island of Taiwan lacked the resources to conquer the mainland, and mainland China then lacked the military capability to carry out a very difficult amphibious invasion, especially when Taiwan enjoyed the implicit backing of the United States. Two developments, political and military, have since made that uneasy peace harder to sustain. On the political side, nationalism is growing on both sides, but in different ways. On the mainland, China's ruling regime has used Chinese nationalism to unite the population behind the Communist Party and hold off demands for political change. Taiwan's situation is slightly different. The political generation that fled the mainland at the end of China's civil war in 1949 is long gone. Today, more and more Taiwanese think of themselves as quite distinct from China with their own society. Younger Taiwanese view the claim that Taiwan is an integral part of China as somewhat ridiculous. Taiwan is a prosperous democracy, and Beijing's authoritarian rule is not attractive. The problem is that Beijing has made clear that if Taiwan were ever to declare itself independent, that would be grounds for war. On the military side, China increasingly possesses the power to make victory in such a war possible. China's economic growth has been invested in its navy and air force. If war came between China and Taiwan, it would present the United States with a difficult problem. The U.S. has followed a path of strategic ambiguity. It's suggested that Taiwan's security is important to it and that it would accept only a peaceful resolution of the mainland's disputes with Taiwan. On the other hand, the United States has not made an explicit guarantee that it would go to war to defend Taiwan. Its goal is to discourage China from a military solution. The United States continues to muster far more military capability than China in the aggregate. But a war over Taiwan would be fought in China's neighborhood. The Taiwan Strait is only 100 miles across, so China would have full use of its land-based systems, while the United States would largely be operating from the sea. China could also use a nuclear bluff. Would the United States be willing to risk a nuclear exchange for Taiwan's sake? Without question, a U.S.-China war would be a human and economic catastrophe. And the uneasy status quo is better than war, if you look at the situation from the standpoint of profit and loss. But political leaders don't always think in those terms. Thucydides, the ancient Greek historian, suggested that international relations are governed by fear, honor, and interest. While material interest suggests that war is a terrible idea, the countervailing fear of political upheaval at home, or the commitment to national honor and integrity might push things in another direction. 
And there's always the risk of a mistake or miscalculation that produces an outcome no one wants. With China, as with Russia, the key for the United States and the West is careful, sober foreign policy that takes account of all interests. It's not a game for amateurs or easy slogans.